Our gracious Heavenly Father, we stand just as we pray in your, in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, and we praise you that we have such an access that's based upon the finished work of Christ and not upon our own merit. May the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, sealing that which is true and stripping away anything that is not of you so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we're still studying together in the first chapter of the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Philippians. Uh, I've spent some time looking at uh, the first chapter we've we've come to a section that in which I think it's important for us to understand uh, uh, review a little bit of the background that we've previously come to see uh, in this picture sort of get a bird's eye view of really what's going on before we even go any further in my last video uh, I talked about for how Paul said when he said for me to lit to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We talked a little bit about that, but I, I want to try to give us a uh, uh, sort of ground us more, I guess, and before we even go any further into the second chapter, we just really need to be grounded in in the facts of what's what we're being shown here by the Holy Spirit. I think one of the best places to start in sort of a somewhat of trying to review where we've come so far is just is in understanding the fact that first and foremost we're not looking at the feelings of paul the logic of paul the reasonings of paul the emotions of paul even though those certainly show up in the text but, but what we are looking at is god the holy spirit the author not paul who merely held the pen and he wrote what God wanted wrote. It's, it's important that we understand that before we even go any further at all. Secondly, we need, to, we need to kind of understand just who Paul was. And not just who Paul was, you know, Pharisee of the Pharisee, you know, he was highly esteemed among his people. He was very learned, educated in the Old Testament. He was a, a Jew above all Jews. It's not just that we need to understand who Paul was, but we need to understand in this particular context where Paul is. We also need to understand that Paul is said to be a prototype, literally, of all those who would thereafter believe. There are... The, the temptation for me is to take and and try in some way to compare my life with Paul. And of course, I know that that's impossible. There is, I mentioned this in my previous video, there is, there is no way that I could ever think that I've suffered the way that Paul suffered or suffered the way that Job suffered or Elijah suffered, even though Elijah and I do have quite a few things in common. Uh, which we won't. That's not the, the subject of this video. What I really have prayed and hoped that you people would see and understand is that we are looking at something that the Holy Spirit wants us to see, which is one of his people, Paul, who was chosen, who had the background that he did, was put thrust into a situation in which he had no control of, over. He was, he was a bond slave of Jesus Christ, bond servants. Of course, Timothy was too. And the fact of the matter is that that's, that's what we are. We are bond servants of Jesus Christ. Paul could not do anything other than what he did, which, which led to him being... In, in all reality, it led to him being where he was, but God placed him there. Now, uh, I'm always looking for a reasonable application. If 
folks in the text. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that Paul is our example, not, in, not in, the, in, in the sense that we're to emulate his, you know, we look at Paul and we glorify him, you know, because of, we, we credit him with his own ingenuity and his own dedication and his own experience and his own uh, uh, enthusiasm and, and, and zeal. And, and we, we just, we look at the life of Paul and we, we say, okay, this is how Paul was. This is how obviously that we are to be. Uh, Paul has, the Holy Spirit has opened up the curtain, drew back the curtain, given, and gave us a glimpse of Paul's life, uh, which we are to then emulate, okay, simply by the law, through the law, through our own self-effort, our own self-strength, our own dedication. We just, Paul was so dedicated, we need to be so dedicated too. Paul was so successful, you know, successful. Uh, he was so, uh, he was just uh, in the sense that he was successful. He had no confidence in the flesh, but he was successful in the sense that it, it appears that he was doing everything that Christ wanted him to do. That he was living precisely the way, you know, that, look, if we don't understand first and foremost from the outset that Paul was taken out of that legal system and placed into a relationship with Christ that was under grace, or that Paul is now under grace. Now everything that we look at is filtered or should be filtered by grace. Uh, verse 21 chapter of chapter 1, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay? The verse is not saying that for me to live is to serve Christ, that for me to live is to worship Christ, for me to live is to think about Christ, for me to live is to meditate on Christ, for me to live is to sacrifice for Christ, give my all for Christ. It says for me to live is Christ. And there's a, there's a huge difference. And when Christ our life shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. So we go on now in more detail in our study in, in looking at who Paul was, where he was, the place that God had positioned him, and, and the, keeping in mind that he's positioned us, each one of us, every single one of us, without exception, in the place we are where he intends for us to be at any given moment. That, that may be a, a difficult concept for many Christians to wrap their mind around, but the fact of the matter is, is that wherever you are right now, if you are one of God's people, if you are a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if Christ died in your place, then I don't care where you are. Where you are is where God intends for you to be. This is where He put you. This is where He placed you. He doesn't work. God doesn't work around human will. Okay, human will is is intrinsically our so-called freedom of will, if you want to call it that, is inseparably linked to the absolute supreme sovereignty of God in control over our lives. He, he, he bought us with a price. He can do what he wants to with us. And he did that. That's what he did with Paul. That's what he does with you and me. Uh, since I live in the flesh, Paul says, since, and, and that word since is very strong in the Greek. It's not the usual first class condition of, well, you know, we're, it's saying if I live in the flesh and I will, that's, that would be a, a first class condition because we can take the if and we can trans, transplant the word since in the place of if because it's followed by a verb in the indicative mood if I'm going to the store and I am that's the verb is followed by the indicative mood therefore I can tra translate that since I'm going to the store since I live in the flesh this is this to me is works he says fruit yet what I would choose I have not yet perceived I, I have not yet made known this is how you could take that or you could say that Paul himself doesn't even know 
since, but he since I live in the flesh. In Timothy, I read that Paul is a prototype of all who should hereafter believe. The way that God called Paul out is an illustration of how God is going to work in, in all of us who hear the gospel and believe. It, it, it is a strong passage of scripture on the sovereignty of God and his great concern for those whom he loves. That's important to understand because that is a motivating factor. That is, a, that is the engine behind everything that drove Paul to do what he did. It was grace, not law. Uh, God has made an infinite provision for his own family. We see over and over again the Holy Spirit speaking of Paul as a prisoner of grace. The fruit of the Spirit, folks, is we know is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithness, uh, faith, meekness, uh, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Paul, imprisoned in Rome, has written a letter to the Philippians in which he declares that his life is Christ, that death is gain, that living in the flesh is serving Christ. I believe all of that, but I believe that there's more in this text. I, I think there's more that we need to see in this text. I've looked at articles and commentaries, and I've listened to sermons on this particular passage over the years, and I am, without question, in most every case, I'm asked to put my eyes on the man Paul and not the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I agree that he's a great example, but it's what example is it that we're following, okay? Are we following the results of the work God's doing in his life? Okay, are we following something that Paul is doing in order for, for God to work a certain way in his life? I, I wish I was better at explaining this. I wish I knew the measure of sacrifice, commitment, dedication, selflessness that we see in the Apostle Paul. I look at the life of Paul and I see him giving up everything for Christ. I look at my life, I, I, I've given up nothing for Christ. You know, it's easy for me to say I long for that dedication. I long for that commitment where that all I can see is, 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 is Paul in my life. Or I long, okay, for that dedication, for that commitment where that all, where that, all that I can see is Christ. Because that's what Paul was seeing so fixed his mind so fixed so settled on things above that the things of this life mean nothing to paul to live is christ and to die is to appear with him in glory and since he the spirit lives in my flesh here below this is a this there the Holy Spirit plays an enormous part and role in everything we've seen in Philippians chapter 1. We don't often really give, uh, I think, well, you go to church today and uh, the whole emphasis in many churches is just on the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Everything's about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said he wouldn't glorify himself. He said he wouldn't glorify Christ. Speak not of himself, but of Christ. But the Christians very seldom today, and this is just my opinion, really think about the Holy Spirit and the role that he does play in our lives. Uh, C. 
since he, the spirit, lives in my life here below, the flesh in the sense of my physical flesh, who works fruit. That's literally what the Greek says, works fruit. What am I saying? I'm saying that in the flesh, there's nothing that pleases God. They that, that are in the flesh cannot please God. They're not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can, be, can they be. Uh, and I'm quoting from Romans chapter 8. I see that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I see in me a conflict. You know, the, the things which I would not, these I allow, the things which I, I would, these I don't do. It's no more I that do it then, but sin that dwells in me. I see sin dwelling in the flesh. Now, surely in, in, in the seventh chapter of Romans, we don't, we're not seeing uh, the ramblings of a man who's immature and he doesn't know what, he, what he's talking about. I see the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Why has God chosen to work in and through flesh? You and me. And what is he doing in his work in and through the flesh? Okay. I have at my disposal, you have at your disposal, all of his reputation. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, his reputation. That's what you have. And all of these resources, which were supplied to you on the basis of God's grace. That's what you have. Okay. That's what you have. That's what I have. And I see God the Holy Spirit saying, I live in flesh and that works fruit. For me to live is Christ. In Galatians chapter 5, we see the works of the flesh. And it, it lists all of that. And all of that is related to law. They're all related to law. On the other hand, the fruit of the Spirit is love. We don't have any laws about love. We don't have any laws about joy. We don't have any laws about peace. We move, we have moved from the area of law to the, to the sphere, the area, the realm of grace. But look at what the text says. Yet what I would choose, I have not yet perceived. That's the way I translate it. You could put constrained in there. I'm, I'm held from either side. I am held between the two. I have the desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. There, there's, your, there's your statement directly from the Holy Spirit through, Paul, through the writer of the, of, of the Philippians. To the Philippians, you have a direct statement by God himself that says there's nothing wrong with you expecting the Lord to return. Or, or desiring or wanting the Lord to return. Or, or to, to feel like that it would be better to, to depart and be with Christ because that's far better. If that's how you feel uh, and somebody, you know, one of your Christian friends thinks that you're, you've just gone off half cracked, well, that's you just show them the verse. Paul says it's far better. Well, of course it's far, far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful because of you. And I, you got to see Paul's heart in that verse. I see in it, not just Paul's heart, but I see in it the heart of God. It's not unusual to hear Christians say that, well, someday the Lord is going to come back. But, you know, but I, and I know he will, but I hope not. I just, I hope not now. I, I mean, I just started this company, just bought me a new truck. You know, I'd like to drive it for, you know, get a few miles on it. I just got married. You know, this would be a bad time for Christ to come. I'd at least like to, to have that experience. I'd like to have my baby. I'd like to raise my kids. I'd like to, to finish my education, whatever, whatever. Uh, there is a special crown for those who love is appearing. Isn't that what it says? Everybody loves his appearing so then, right? I mean, right? No, I don't think they do. I, 
I've come to the conclusion that most Christians are absolutely certain Christ is going to come someday, yet they, they hope with all their heart that it doesn't happen for a while yet. You know, unless they're going through some extremely hard times. You know, unless they're very, very sick, unless they're very discouraged, or there's a, there's a, they're, they're sitting there in, in an ash heap like Job, or they're like Elijah who wanted to toss it all in. You know, folks, look, I'm not being critical. Listen, the greatest men of God have wanted to do that. Elijah said, there's none but me. I want to quit. God said, fine, I don't need you. You know, I'll put Elisha in there. Job, you wouldn't let me take my breath. You, you wouldn't let me commit suicide. I wanted to quit. God wouldn't let me do it. And my heart goes out to those who are greatly discouraged. I don't know what lies ahead for myself or for you. I don't know. I don't think any of us know. Imagine God sees us as longing for His appearing only when we feel hopeless, desperate. I, loving His appearing is not the norm in Christianity. And yet I see not only the Apostle Paul, but the Holy Spirit saying that the great desire of the heart of God is that this program be consummated and that we all be with Him. You know, I'm certain that Paul loved his appearing. You know, the popular idea today is that, you know, the, the, the privileged portion of Christianity will be those who live to see the rapture. You know, we're, we're that special group. You know, if we, if we, sir, I mean, listen, folks, if we, if we look at the, the heart of the Apostle Paul here, I don't see Paul saying that my great desire is to wait till the rapture, till Christ comes back, you know, the clouds open and, and he returns with all his, I don't look to be wrapped to rapture out of here, you know, to rapture out all those who are alive and remain. That's what I'm really, really looking for. I don't see him saying that. No, I hear him say in this context, in this context, listen to me, folks. I hear him say that he is constrained with a desire to simply depart and be with Christ. We see the heart of Paul and the Holy Spirit concerned more about the needs of others over and above self-desire. Hello, what was it Christ did for you? Did, did Christ not do the same thing for us that we see Paul doing in the case of the Philippians? How he felt about the Philippians and how we ought to feel about one another. And, and none of that is brought about through law. That, that's an important fact. If, if all you're going to do is begin reading in Philippians, starting with verse 1 of chapter 1, and you go all the way through the first chapter, and you're looking at, and you're just looking, and you've got your highlighter in your hand, and you're highlight this, i got to do this, and let's see, i got to do this, and uh, you know, I'm going to change to another color, so I want this to really be bold, because i really got to do that. And if that's what you do, You're not seeing Christ. Over and over again in this book, I see God call me one who is loved, one whom he loves. God loves you. He always loves you. You know, we speak of the love of God. Christians today, they, they talk about the love of God. And I, I think that when they... When they you, for the most part, we, we, they use that, that word love almost in the same way that songwriters do, you know, that are trying to come up with a good hook for a love song or something. I, you know, I, look, you know, we, we, we picture, here's what we picture. We picture a God who loves us because we're good, you know. He loves us because we serve. He loves us because we pray, because we're kind. You know, He loves us because we're this, that, or the other thing. How about He just loves us because we're His? Is that really that hard for you to wrap your mind around? And he always loves us. 
doesn't love you less when you sin, doesn't love you more when you don't sin. He loves you. You may not long to be with him, but I promise you he longs to be with you. And he doesn't need you or me. You know, he, he can speak through a donkey, all right, if he wants to. And as I peek into the heart of, of God, that Paul has a deep desire to be with Christ, but to abide in this, continue on in this flesh, is the more necessary because of you, more needful for you, on account of you. That I realize what God desires for me and for you. We, we need to bear in mind the following facts here. First, the Holy Spirit is the author, not Paul. We're not looking at Paul's, Paul's feelings and emotions. We need to understand who Paul was. We need to understand where he was. He was in, your, he, he, he was in his prison. You're in yours. I don't know what it is, but you're in it. I'm in it. How can I bring any charge, any fault, any have any complaint against these vi these videos not getting any views? Okay. Uh, let's see. I got a choice. I can have a bar big barbecue with my family and my grandkids out in the backyard. We can do shish kebab and or you know whatever. Throw some steaks on the grill and you know and we can play, you know, uh, what do they, what do they do nowadays? Badminton. I don't know whatever. You know we can do all this. The kids will swim in the pool. They'll splash around in the pool. It'll be a great time. I, let's see, I can do that or I can listen to Steve talk for 45 minutes on suffering for Christ's sake. Uh, I'm not being critical, folks. I'm not. It, the point is, is that if, if these videos just got one view, if, I don't know, how could I say it? If, if there was just one Philippian, okay, that heard Paul and benefited from what the Holy Spirit said through Paul, then then Paul was in the right place. I, I don't think we fully understand, we've grasped, most Christians today just fully wrap their arms around just how God is working in their lives. Uh, do you think God is just some the hound of heaven dogging your heels, just watching you with a, with a spyglass to make sure that you do everything right? And he's going to be there to, you know, and it, of course, yeah, he'll pick you up when you stumble and you fall down. He'll carry you a ways and then he'll set you back down and then you got to try it again and maybe you'll do better next time. Is that how you view the Christian life? That's not how Paul viewed it. That's not how the Holy Spirit presents it in the first chapter of Philippians. To abide in this flesh is the more necessary because of you, more needful for you. He was a prototype for all that would thereafter believe. He was bound, okay, by God to do what he did. He couldn't be anywhere else. He couldn't do anything else other than what he did. This person is where? And he's doing what? The work of the Holy Spirit is a vital factor in all of this. The Holy Spirit is not here to make sure that we don't blow ourselves off the map. Okay? The Holy Spirit is with us because of us. Jesus said, absolutely necessary I depart. If I don't depart, the Comforter won't come. God says, I have a great inheritance for you. You know, you, and, you know, and it, as a down payment on that, I've given you the Holy Spirit. Well, we want a million bucks. You know, we want to, we you know, we want a really good life. He's given us the Holy Spirit. And, and in order for God to give, to give you the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ needed to die in your place. There is nothing that you could offer me that I would take in exchange for the knowledge that there dwells within me the spirit of the living God. You couldn't buy from me the truth that he knows the way that I take. You couldn't buy from me that when he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. 
that he knows my name so well, in fact, that he's burned it on the palms of his hands, that he lights my candle, that he bottles my tears, he bottles every tear that rolls down my cheek, that he works all things together for my good, that he's working in me both the will and the do of his good pleasure, and that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Why do we search to know the more obscure things about the heart of God and spend so much time on that? It's things that he hasn't revealed to us at the expense of not understanding the love and the grace of God that blankets our lives. If you understand that frustration of mine, then you ought to understand the frustration of Paul in Galatians. You ought to understand the feelings that I have for God's people just as Paul had for the Philippians. We are related by blood, folks. His spirit witnesses with my spirit that I'm his child. I wouldn't sell you that witness. I wouldn't give up that witness. God longs to be with us. The Spirit in us longs to be with Christ. And I, and I see the heart of God saying that that which is necessary, that which is needful, is that the Holy Spirit be here with us in the flesh. Till when? I, I don't know. I haven't perceived that yet, says Paul. But the longing of the heart of God, which, which ought to be reflected in the longing of the, of the hearts of his people, is to depart and be with Christ. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is the necessary part because of what? World peace? No. Because of you. Not, not because of peace between nations, not or famine or war or inflation or, or not because of any, any corporate advancement, uh, educational opportunities, medical advancements, no, but because of one another. God is concerned about us. God is interested in us, not in programs as much as his own people. And the necessity is there because of us, not because of the terror, not because of the goats, not because of Satan's activities, but because of you. And because of me, who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I see in this, in this, in this passage an absolute confidence that God will not leave us nor forsake us, as long as the Holy Spirit is here in one believer. I mean, think about it, folks. It, there will never be two believers, only two believers left. Oh, there's only two believers left in the world. And, uh, but there was, on, there was only two believers left in the world, but one died, and now there's only one. You're the last Christian on earth. That'll never happen. That'll never happen. It has to be two. It's got to be at least two here. The, the other... One for the other, okay? For the other, okay? There'll never be a, a sole survivor, a lone believer here, okay? Can't happen. He will not leave us nor forsake us as long as the Holy Spirit is here in one believer. In, in Thessalonians, we're told that he who hinders will continue to hinder until he's taken out of the way. And that says to me that at that particular time, Whenever it might be, that is the time that God has chosen when taking the Holy Spirit out of the way, He must take all of those in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, which is what we've come to know as the rapture. The day will come when there is no longer a need for the Holy Spirit to be here. Therefore, God takes every single one in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. I would not have you ignorant brethren concerning them which sleep. You know the passage. I believe the passage here is not only inferring that that's going to happen, but that, but that the passage is saying that, that 
the one is better than the other. That is to depart and be with the Lord. From a personal perspective, obviously it's better. You'd have to be, really, I'm sorry. You'd have to be an idiot to say it's not better. It's better. Paul's heart is not just looking to his own needs, but to the needs of others. The day may come when I die and I find myself in the presence of my Lord, or the day may come when I see the clouds part and the Lord descend from heaven with a shout, and I look up in utter amazement at the glory of my Savior, and here I have a passage that is telling me that until that appointed time, to remain for one another is needful. To remain for one another is needful. And that, whether I depart in the rapture or whether I depart in what we call death. But it'll be with the Holy Spirit. That is because, and well, I'm not going to get into the whole death is our rapture thing, but the Lord is my shepherd. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Folks, I want you to know the longing of oneness with Christ so that our eyes are fixed on things above and the things on this earth won't make any difference. The desires of this life will be so small. Our minds, our attention, our affection will be settled where Christ sits at the right hand of God. It's God who tells me, that it's absolutely necessary that Paul remain in the flesh. Not just that Paul remain in the flesh for the, for the need of the Philippians, but in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in the writing of the epistle, in the endurance of the word, and in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's absolutely necessary, says the Holy Spirit, that he remain with me. Can I not see in the passage an illustration of, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee? Because God deems it necessary that he remain with me. Since I have this confidence, verse 25, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all. For your advancement in the faith. For your joy in the faith. Do you have the confidence? that God will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, despite the present problems in your life, the difficulties, the, the terrible conflict of the flesh, can you say that? Are we shored up by the confidence that Paul had that, that, he, that God will never leave us nor forsake us, that He will abide and continue with us? I know my sheep, and they know me, and I give unto them eternal life. And somebody says to me, yeah, I had that once. Well, if you, if, and it wasn't eternal life. And they shall never perish. The Holy Spirit is not, he's not with me to condemn me. He's not with me to convict me or to torment me. But for our advancement in the faith, for our joy in the faith, if you place that advancement all on me, there can't be much joy. And for those of you out there who are paragons of virtue, you know, your pillars of, uh, you think your pillars of spiritual strength, well, you know, look, all right, look, you got, you got my deepest en envy, all right? I, I'll just say it. But as pastor of this ministry, I am not that. Oh, wretched man I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this sin and death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. So with my mind, I serve the law of God, and with my flesh, the law of sin. Romans chapter 7. I can look at people like Paul and say, oh, you know, I can understand how it would be their uh, advancement and their joy, but when I look at the lust, the evil, the sin, the stumbling, the wickedness that surrounds my life, how can there be any advancement and joy? And yet that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't convict you of sin. The Spirit convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And if, and if you're the world, that's fine. Okay, I'm not of this world. I may be in it, but I'm not of it. Christ has taken me out of this world. And if you're in the world, of course, the, the Holy Spirit is convicting you, but not me. He encourages me. He comforts me. He assures me 
of his love for me, like a father would his son, knowing that his, 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 I'm knowing he's going to have a naughty kid. Let me tell you ahead of time, if you've never had any children and you're planning to raise a family, you know, let me tell you, they're going to be naughty. I mean, you know, and you only need to know one word until the kid's 21, and that's no. You know, but you want that child to know he's loved, that he's secure, that he's part of the family. You're not going to love him because he's good and, and hate him because he's bad. You know, God is not Santa Claus checking whether you're naughty or nice. He loves you. He wants you to rest in the certainty of that love and that position in Christ. Not just your spiritual position, but your physical position, your physical condition, your surroundings, your circumstances, because God placed you there for the advancement of the gospel. All through this, it's we're being encouraged to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, where that death works in us, as Paul said, but life in you. Look, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. Hope you're having a blessed weekend. Until next time, thanks for watching.